I am Dr. Philip McMillan, and I continue to ask difficult questions that may disrupt the narrative. And today, I'm looking at another recently published paper that is, as usual in my mind, giving a false sense of the picture because it's missing out an important part or piece of the puzzle. And this one is accelerated vascular aging after COVID-19 infection. Mm -hmm. Very important study. And you may notice that more and more of these studies are coming out because they are looking at the fact that the illness and mortality is all being driven by COVID. I understand that and I can appreciate why they're doing that. But I am here to make sure that they don't miss the other piece of the puzzle, which is that what I'm saying is that a lot of what is being driven is what I call the COVID storm, a situation where you have recurring COVID infection in a cohort who is already vaccine primed. That's the essence of what they don't want to talk about. And this is why these conversations are not actually liked very much but we still have to ask them. So before I start to share with you what's going on, I want you to remember that in detail, I'll be covering this, COVID's hidden time bomb, rapid arterial aging, linked to this paper. I've taken a very deep dive on it and the link is in the description because this is a big topic. It's a complex topic and one that I think needs a lot of attention. So I was initially going to talk about this paper in detail, but I realized that if I don't address this properly, you may miss the nuance of what is going on. So I'm going to share with you a few simple points with regards to what I'll be covering in that presentation. You just have to understand a few basic bits of information about how the arterial system works and what they're looking at in terms of inflammation. And what you have here is an evidence of an, an artery, an aorta, say for instance. And what we're interested in is the fact that this gets thicker or stiffer in relation to COVID infection, or as I think, spike protein exposure. And this is something that we have been looking at for some time, especially the inflammation with the lining, what we call the vasovasorum, blood vessels, around these large arteries. This is an important piece of the puzzle. And what I think that they are starting to find is that COVID infection can drive inflammation in that region of the heart or in that region of the vascular system. So to understand what they were looking at, because they were looking at a very specific thing in the context of increased inflammation. And this was what we call, uh, in terms of the rapid vascular aging, they were then looking specifically at a condition that we call PWV, which is about pulse wave velocity. That's what they were looking at here, pulse wave velocity. And it's an important measurement and not something that we necessarily do routinely, but it could be done routinely because it, it gives an indication as to how stiff the arteries are. And what I've got here is a site talking about pulse wave velocity, PWV, and arterial stiffness assessment, thoracic key. And I just wanted to give you an idea as to what it is that they're looking at. And you can see here, they take a probe, they put it at the neck, the carotid artery. They have another probe at the femoral artery, and they look at the difference in the pulse waves. And that will give them, in terms of time and the shape of it, an understanding as to how stiff the aorta is. And so this gives us an idea as to arterial aging and the link to heart disease, hypertension, dementia. So it's a very important test. And you can see it here being performed um, where they're using two people, one at the neck, one at the femoral region, and they are looking carefully at the pulse waves and the timing between them. And so this is what this paper was looking at.
and they found some important things. One of them was that it didn't matter too much with regards to whether or not people were infected. And when they looked at the pulse wave velocity here, and they were looking overall at all these cohorts, whether or not somebody was in ICU, whether or not they were just hospitalized, whether or not they had COVID and were non-hospitalized, and whether or not they were COVID negative. And you can see here the COVID negative had the lowest pulse wave velocity. That's what you would expect. Now, you may think to yourself, why am I focused on this? And what is the relevance of it? Now, the reason it had caught my attention is that it was, again, one of those very few studies that included vaccination status. And it was very clear in the context of the study that when they looked at vaccination status, they found that if people were vaccinated, so this is here, persistent symptoms, and they're looking at the pulse um, wave velocity, if there were persistent symptoms, yes, they had higher pulse wave velocity, women versus men, not so much of a difference in men. And if they had were vaccinated, you had a better outcome with pulse wave velocity, a bit more for women than for men. And so this caught my attention because it was one of the rare studies where they showed vaccination status. And I thought, wow, they're listening. They're actually starting to do what it is that I hope they would do, which is give us a better understanding as what was happening in relation to vaccination. However, when I looked more carefully at the study, and this is part of the reason why I think I want to go into more detail on it, is that when they looked at the COVID negative, COVID positive, non-hospitalized, COVID positive, hospitalized, COVID positive in ICU, and this is the pulse wave velocity here, the trend, and this is over a 12 to two month, uh, two, two, one year to two year period. If they're on ICU, there's inflammation, uh, it comes down gradually, which is good. Similarly, if they're hospitalized. If they're non-hospitalized, you can see a very slight increase, which is where they're talking about COVID-positive infection increases this risk. But what caught my attention was this COVID-negative, because this has one of the steepest rises over the period of time, V1 and V2. That could be anywhere between one and two years. And so my question was, hold on, why is this rising if they are COVID negative? Because in effect, they didn't have a COVID infection. Why would this be rising higher than if they had a COVID infection and were not hospitalized? That's where the gap came in you can then call it out. And so when I looked at that, as I searched through the paper, it clearly was able to show me the vaccinated cohort who were hospitalized, their ICU, the percentages, but for some reason, they did not include it for the COVID negative cohort. And they didn't have a good explanation for why this COVID negative cohort would have such a rise in terms of their pulse wave velocity. If anything, it should be largely neutral in such a short period of time. So these are the things I'll be going through in this presentation and break down what it likely means in the context of health. If my instinct is right, that this is because of spike protein exposure in that COVID negative cohort. That's my hypothesis. That's my extrapolation, so you can't take it as fact, but it is what I've been looking at for a number of years, and therefore what I would expect to find. So this is why I explained that when it comes to the science, if you know what to look for, it doesn't matter what they put out there. It doesn't matter what the authors say. If you know the data, understand where to look, you can find where the gaps are. And one of the big gaps is we know COVID infection causes inflammation and damage to the glycocalyx. 
what the question that I'm trying to figure out is, what are the risks, especially in low risk cohorts who had been vaccinated, did you put them at higher risk on re-exposure or otherwise, or even just from spike protein exposure for many of these complications? So this is what we'll be covering in this presentation, this hidden time bomb, rapid arterial aging. And based on the trajectory that we saw in that paper, for some reason, it is happening the fastest in the COVID negative cohort who are apparently younger. So if you want to understand the implications of that and understand where we're going in terms of the science, join us. The link is below. We'll be covering some of the important principles about the glycocalyx and the lining of the blood vessels and the fact that I'm predicting that they almost become like potholes, you know, along the lining of the blood vessels. Instead of it being smooth road, it's damaged. And this damage then increases the risk of all kinds of inflammatory processes in the blood vessels. And we'll be covering issues about this glycocalyx. This is the lining on the inside, this very soft hair-like structure that protects the cells beneath. When this gets damaged, you end up with increased stiffness. So this is why I said, when the science comes out, if you know where to look, you can find all the holes in it. And this is what I'm doing, dissecting out the implications across the population, because if this is happening, we need to know and we need to understand why. So as I said, final reminder, join me. Uh, the link is in the description below. It will be about 10 days from now. This is an important conversation. We need to understand this ticking time bomb. And critically, we need to find ways in those who are potentially at risk, how can we mitigate this? Have a great evening.